Can everybody hear me? We're going to have a height adjustment mid uh, presentation here. Um, Lucas and I are both going to uh, talk about some research that, uh, that we're leading right now in Lake Ontario. Um, but they're really looking at uh, steps to address impediments of lake trout restoration. So though we're the lucky ones that get to talk about this today, um, this is a group effort. This is a CSMI year for Lake Ontario. So we have collaborators um, in, in Canada and the U.S. Um, that are putting in a lot of effort here. Um, from Omen RF, DFO, University of Windsor, and, and Carleton University on the North Shore, on the South Shore, it's uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Dmitry Gorski is one of the co-leads on this project as well, USGS, uh, DEC, and then Sea Grant as well. So there's, there's a bunch of us working on this, and it all stems from the Lake Trout Working Group, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So Brian uh, O'Malley did a great job of setting this up for us. I can kind of scoot through these slides, but really we're looking at relevance of uh, restoration over the last 50 years of, of lake trout in Lake Ontario. So this uh, figure here gives you commercial catch throughout time, and it's really just a, a nice picture to show you where the collapse happened, where we see local extirpations that are kind of functional. There was probably a few fish still swimming out there, but they weren't uh, performing ecosystem functions. So that happened in the 60s. We started stocking in the 70s, and we've had a pretty good success. Um, with uh, catches of hatchery origin adult lake trout. So we have the stock biomass in the lake. Um, you can see from the last few years here, from since the 80s, um, though this isn't just commercial catches, this is angling push, plus our surveys that are out there collecting fish. We have an abundance of, of hatchery origin fish, but um, as you just saw from Brian O'Malley, um, we have low wild recruitment. And so on the U.S. side, at least, this is hovering right around 2-3% annually. This year it was, it was less than 1, so not great. Um, so in 2020 and 2021, the LO2C Lake Trout Working Group um, was tasked with identifying current impediments, so updating the 2014 document. Um, so we took a couple years. There were 12-15 uh, of us that talked uh, every two weeks, so it was quite exhaustive in, uh, in, our, in our research. Um, Overwhelmingly, what we agreed upon um, was that impediments are occurring at early life stages for Lake Trout, at least in Lake Ontario. Um, and importantly, um, our research uh, uh, priorities identified habitat and specifically degraded spawning habitats um, as a leading impediment in Lake Ontario. So is habitat an impediment? If you were here last year, you hear, heard me drone on about uh, degraded habitat in Lake Ontario and Lake Erie, and I'm not going to do that today, but Brian Whitehall will later. Um, so he, I'll just give you two pieces of information that we do know. The extent of spawning locations at a lake scale in Lake Ontario isn't really known. Uh, the accounts that we have come from the 1800s and 1900s from commercial fishers. Those were all cataloged in um, uh, Carroll's spawning atlas from 1982, um, and so we do have some indication of where lake trout spawn. But an important um, caveat here is that historic sites were identified with a wild stock. So you saw that drop down where we lost our wild stock, functional extirpation in Lake Ontario. And all of these, the fish that we have in the system now, 97 to 99% of them, at least on the U.S. side, are hatchery origin fish. So we have some evidence to suggest that these fish may or may not, there's a, a bit of disagreement here, but do they behave like their wild counterparts? Um, and if they don't, they might not be using the same areas. So some evidence for that, um, we know that uh, sites that we are currently studying, USGS, Fish and Wildlife, um, our partners on, in Canada are studying, that there is degradation in some of the known spawning sites. So this right here is a spawning site in the eastern basin of Lake Ontario. Um, Ellen Marsden and a group of people worked on this in, in the 80s. Um, and Stacy Fergal, who's here, worked on this for her master's 30 years later to look at the changes. In, in spawning substrate. So visually, it's pretty easy to see the differences here, right? We have, inter, we have infilling of interstices with dracenid mussels, silts and sands, but what we don't see here is egg deposition. So Ellen Marsden measured uh, a relative abundance of egg deposition in 1988. It was among the highest that's ever been collected in the Great Lakes. It was in the thousands per meter squared. Stacy uh, repeated these efforts in 2017 and 18 and found a single egg just one, not thousands per meter squared. So what that tells us is that either the, the fish that are out there now are not using these same habitats or the eggs that are deposited in these areas are not being, they're not holding there, right? The interstices are filled so they might be moving off. We're not able to collect those eggs. So where are lake trout currently spawning in Lake Ontario? And that's what we're gonna get at for the rest of the presentation. 
this past year was our uh, CSMI year in Lake Ontario. So this stands for, for those who may not be familiar, this is Cooperative Science and Monitoring Initiative. And what it does is it gives us a large amount of funding and a large amount of effort on both sides of the border to answer questions at a much larger scale. So um, we were lucky enough to have two different projects that were funded. I'll talk about the first project and Lucas will talk about the second. Um, so the, the first project I'm going to talk about, uh, we used acoustic telemetry and some um, habitat suitability modeling to get at two um, different objectives. The first was to determine uh, the spatial distribution of spawning areas at a lake scale. So doing this is the largest scale possible that we can. And then uh, stepping into more fine scale details, looking at site specific habitat characteristics, things like depth, slope, um, substrate flow, the aspect of the reef. Um, of where lake trout are actually depositing the eggs, not just where are they during the spawning season, but where do they put their eggs. And then Lucas is going to talk about a habitat characterization project, so I'll let him do that. Okay, so the first step of, our, uh, of, the, of the first um, set of objectives was to develop a predictive model. And to do this, we used a maxent model, which is maximum entropy. Um, and just basically what it does is it takes environmental variables that we've collected previously, and it compares that to presence data, so where were lake trout during a spawning season. Um, and then it gives us a probability um, at a lake scale of, of where those fish may be spawning. And so for our environmental variables, we use depth, slope, fetch, and substrate type. All those are coming from the Great Lakes Aquatic uh, Habitat Framework. Um, so these are readily available online, and thanks to those that have collected that data. Um, and for our presence data, again, we use the, the Goodyear Atlas, and then um, we also added that atlas with known spawning areas that we either study or have been studied since that 82 publication had come out. Um, for to give you a sense of scale, we're doing this at um, 30 square meters throughout the entire lake, so it is a pretty fine scale. This is the, uh, one of the model outputs, and I won't bore you with um, the output uh, necessarily, uh, the details here, but the take home message here is that the more red of an area, the higher probability that Lake Trout would be using that to spawn. And so we can zoom in on an area. Um, this is Eastern Lake Ontario. Um, the model uh, is capped at 60 meters, so you don't see anything out here because we're over 60 meters of depth. But as you look at this, you can see some patterns that many of us could have predicted already, right? Um, the conceptual model of where lake trout spawn is rocky substrates on steep slopes. Um, we did find some interesting things here with uh, predictions based on uh, lake trout spawning on leeward sides. Um, we have a lot of fetch coming from western to eastern Lake Ontario, so this makes sense, right? Those eggs might be blown out if they're on the, the windward side. Um, but this information is cool, but it needs to be ground truth, right? Because it's just a model. It's, it's, not, it's not right. Uh, all models are wrong, just some are better than others. So one way to do that is using acoustic telemetry. We can use acoustic telemetry detections to ground truth what our model is predicting. Um, just briefly, the principle of acoustic telemetry is um, tagging uh, lake trout with an acoustic transmitter. It emits a unique sound sequence. That sound sequence is then picked up by acoustic receiver, which are stationary in Lake Ontario if the fish swims close enough. And what that does, it gives us a timestamp of where that fish was at what time, and it allows us to estimate uh, positioning. And then we can use that, uh, those detections to infer spawning locations. So these yellow dots here are all acoustic receivers, um, and we have really good coverage in Lake Ontario. This is from 2021 on. Um, each year we add more receivers, so we have really good coverage, and it allows us to answer these large spatial uh, scale questions. Starting this past spring, we uh, were tagging lake trout on Lake Ontario. Um, we decided to tag fish in the spring because um, as we have seen from our own publications and others, uh, lake trout have very high spawning site fidelity. So if you tag them in the fall when they're spawning, it's very likely you're not going to learn much. They're just going to return to those same areas that you tagged them. So by tagging in the spring, we were assuming that we we're tagging from a mixed population and this would allow us to find those areas that we didn't know about yet in Lake Ontario, which may have a, a disproportionate um, uh, proportion of, of wild um, fish. So uh, again, starting in spring, we tagged fish. We used gill nets, bottom trolls, and uh, angling wanted a diversity of uh, collection methods to try to collect a diversity of fish. There's, um, as Brian mentioned, we have a, a bunch of different strains in the lake. They um, tend to hang out in different areas potentially, especially the, the more deeper water morphs. And so we wanted to take advantage of those fish as well. Um, we collected fin tissue so we could get a strain assignment and also sex assignment off those fish. So those were sent to Chris Wilson's team um, in Ontario and they worked those up for us. 
I mean, we did all of this work right on the water so that we could minimize the time we actually handled the fish because we want them to survive, right? Here are just some pictures of us collecting fish. We use our research vessels. Um, uh, charter captains were very helpful here to help us collect fish in areas that are harder to get to or that we didn't have time for the research vessels to get to. Um, again, we're conducting uh, all of our surgeries right on the boats um, and kind of our makeshift uh, workstations. These tags might look big and that's because they are. These are the largest tags you can use. They have a 10 year battery span on them. So we have the potential to collect a lot of data from these fish um, to answer the questions that we're trying to. Uh, this is the um, spatial uh, distribution of tagging. So the size of the uh, circle here is, uh, indicates how many fish were tagged and then the color is the agency. And so what this shows you is that we were able to tag quite a few areas in Lake Ontario in just one season. We tagged 320 fish, um, but we did miss a few areas. So this, in, in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna um, hit these areas that we missed um, to, to finish up our tagging efforts. Um, this is just lake length frequency, gives you an idea of uh, the potential uh, age structure of fish that we caught. So our, our minimum was 530. Um, that is usually, a, it's predicted to be an age six fish. That's the first year of spawning. And these are 10 year tags. Um, and then we didn't have a cap for, uh, for maximum size, but we did get a, a good group of distribution of fish sizes and, and potentially ages there as well. This is probably my most exciting slide. Um, Lucas has better ones than me, but um, this is wild lake trout that we caught while we were out tagging. And so uh, it's broken up by the U.S. and, and Canada, and uh, this is a number of, of lake trout that were tagged. We hit the nail right on the head. This is what we usually catch, right, between 2 and 3% on, on the U.S. side. So it wasn't really that exciting for us, other than the fact that we caught six wild fish, or putative wild fish, which we've never tagged before, so we'll learn something from them. But on the uh, North Shore, they caught 40% untagged, unclipped uh, fish. Um, which we're assuming are wild fish. Um, we do have the genetics of the fish to be able to confirm that as well. Um, so they tagged 56 wild fish. Um, something is obviously, if this is real, something's going on over there that we don't have on the South Shore. Um, and these fish and the, their behaviors are gonna teach us something um, and hopefully lead us to the areas where we're having successful reproduction, especially if these are F2 um, fish. This is where the wild fish were caught. So the blue dots are the wild fish, the red are hatchery origin. Uh, the blue dots are just bigger so you can see them because they overlay um, but the majority of those wild fish were caught here by the niagara river or out here on scotch bonnet which is pretty much the only deep water habitat that we have for um, spawning so um, you know we could have predicted that and it, it, it rings true that those fish uh, we had higher percent wild out there um, Okay, I'll give you just a little sneak peek. So these fish were tagged in April and May of last year. Our receivers get pulled out during the summer, so we don't have a full year's worth of data yet. Um, so anything I show you would just be kind of a teaser. And I'm just gonna show you um, one figure. So this gives you the path of a fish that was tagged. Um, it's cool, right, because the fish moved long distance, but that's not really the point of me showing you this. This fish was tagged in the Niagara River in the spring, and our assumption was we're tagging from mixed populations. We're going to find areas by tagging in the spring instead of the fall. And that holds true for this fish. So this fish, again, tagged in April by September when the receivers were pulled out of the lakes. We don't have any more data until we pull them up again this year moved 220 kilometers to what we're assuming could be a, a spawning area, um, which is main duck. We know that fish spawn there. But that tells us that hopefully the rest of the fish that we tagged in the spring are gonna identify areas um, across the lake and not just stay in the general areas that we tag them in. Um, with that, next steps, we're tagging 130 fish in a couple weeks in those areas that we didn't hit last year. Um, the, the fish, the first year's worth of data will be collected this summer, so we'll get that detection data back and then we can start answering questions. And then importantly, uh, we can use that year one not only to find actual locations, but we can inform our model with that data as well. So the next iteration of that MaxN model will have um, more accurate information. And with that, I'll hand it over to Lucas. Thanks, Alex. Um, so just kind of transitioning to a different project, but still under the same uh, umbrella of CSMI, we're going to be talking about our habitat imagery project using drop cameras. Um, uh, Alex went into a, the breakdown of the Maxent model, so I'll, for the sake of brevity, I'll kind of go through this pretty quick. Our methods were um, to 
find uh, ground truthing sites between about two to 30 meters um, on the shores uh, on these kind of expected high probability lake trout spawning areas. Um, the site selection was done by Colin Farrell at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Basin Lower Great Lakes office, um, who selected 3,000 sites across the lake. Of these uh, 3,000 sites, each site would get an ideally five individual drop camera points. Um, the reason we did this was to reduce the bias. So like if we went somewhere and dropped down a camera and it landed on a boulder, but there's nothing else around the boulder, it wouldn't give us just a bias from that single drop camera. And it also provides us with a finer scale resolution. Um, so really quick equipment setup. Uh, for those of you that don't know what a drop camera is, it's exactly what it sounds like. Um, as you can see on the right of that image there, it's a vertically oriented camera that is uh, put inside of a cage. The cage serves multiple purposes. Um, the primary one being that it gives us a sense of scale for when the camera is at the lake bottom. Uh, it gives us a better idea of what the substrate size is. Um, it also protects the camera uh, from getting banged around by any of the rocks that are down there. And it also uh, acts as a weight so that the camera doesn't go flowing off into the current and will actually go down to the bottom. So jumping right into the results, um, what you're looking at right here is a map of Lake Ontario where all of the red dots are um, one of the 5,411 videos that were collected in 2023. Um, of these 5,000 videos, uh, roughly 2,550 have been uh, currently classified. Um, I'll go into how the classifications work and some of the results of the classifications uh, pretty quickly. Um, Right here, what you're looking at is on the y-axis count and on the x-axis is depth, so just a histogram of the depth breakdown of each of the drop camera sites. Um, majority of the depths have centered between 4 to 15 meters, which is the traditional lake trout spawning habitat. 11% um, of the sites are either shallower than 4 meters or uh, deeper than 15, um, which relatively doesn't sound like much, but 11% of 5,400 is still 540 videos across the lake. So we do have pretty good coverage of those shallower and deeper areas. Our classification methods, um, at USGS Labs, we use a slightly adapted version of the uh, NOAA CMEX system. Uh, we adapted just to better fit the project needs for this uh, CSMI year. Um, we uh, classify a dominant and a secondary substrate type, so whatever the most abundant substrate is and then the secondary one after that. There's not always a secondary substrate, but it's nice to have that primary and secondary. And then we also score several variables from zero to four, zero being, you know, terrible or not there or not confident, and four being the ideal, pristine, perfect. Um, these scores are for interstitial spaces. Those are the nooks and crannies and the cracks that the uh, lake trout eggs can fall into and then incubate in. Um, silt thickness and biotic amount are pretty self-explanatory. It's just how thick is the silt coverage at all of these sites and how much uh, vegetation or algae are present. And then confidence value, each time an interp a human interpreter classifies a video, they'll put down between zero to four how confident they are that their classification was accurate. So uh, just some quick substrate definitions. There are eight uh, different types of substrate classifications, six of which are geologic and two of which are biogenic. Biogenic basically just means uh, Dracaena mussels, whether or not they are alive or uh, dead, mussel hash being dead, mussel reef being alive. Um, traditionally, we think of uh, boulder and cobble as being kind of the ideal lake trust spawning habitat because those are gonna have the most abundant uh, interstitial spaces. Um, I'll just also note that we have not found a granule uh, size substrate definition uh, yet. So I kind of broke down what we're talking about on paper, but what are we actually seeing? So um, the good it might be difficult to see, but those are large boulders and cobbles that are providing a lot of deep, high quality interstitial spaces for eggs uh, that can land in and incubate in over time. Um, the bad is pretty much the exact opposite. Our camera will go down and land in a patch of silt that will sink in several inches or land on a bed of sand that has no interstitial spaces of any biological value. And then the ugly, uh, the unfortunate reality of the um, kind of abundant coverage of uh, Dracaena mussels in Lake Ontario, you can even see on the good uh, pictures there that there are those boulders are covered in live uh, Dracaena mussels. But then when those mussels die, they often leave 
large patches of their um, uh, shell hash on the bottom, which can make it impossible to identify any substrate that are below those muscle hash. Um, but at the end of the day, if an egg lands on that hash, that is the hash is essentially the substrate that that egg is going to be incubated on. So it becomes the substrate value. Okay, so some results of the classifications that we have so far. Um, just to move kind of through this a little bit quicker. The, the big takeaway from this being the boulder, which is the orange, and the cobble, which is kind of that olive green color. Um, those are those ideal substrates that we're looking for, and those are really only being found between four to eight meters in depth. And then once you get out past 10 meters is where you're looking at mostly fine substrates and muscle hash. So those poor quality interstitial spaces that really aren't providing anything for uh, the late shot eggs. And then similarly, what you're looking at here is depth on the y-axis and then that interstitial grade on the x-axis. Um, from left to right is zero to four. Again, zero being very poor quality habitat. There's nothing there. And four being kind of the idealized um, interstitial grade uh, level. Um, we're seeing, again, similar to the ranges of boulders and cobble between five to eight meters for our um, grade four interstitial spaces. I will note though that of the 2,500 video classifications that have been done, only 23 have been um, grade four interstitial spaces. And then it's similar to uh, kind of the past 10 meters, um, really nothing of, inter nothing of value in terms of interstitial spaces. Um, so moving forward, continue to classify the videos. We're about halfway done, um, hoping to be done in the next two to three weeks to have all the final videos classified. And then more data collection to come in the spring and fall of 2024. We need to avoid the uh, growth of aquatic vegetation so that we can actually see what's on the lake bottom to identify it. Um, with more sites needing to be collected in Canada, the southern shorelines, and sort of the islands in the eastern basin. And then some quick acknowledgments funding provided by GLRI and Sea Grant. And I'm out of time, so I can't thank all of the video collectors individually. But you know, if you're out there, thank you. This, this data wouldn't be possible without the dozens and dozens of video collectors. Um, and so if we have any time left for questions.